Number 10, Sam Wilson problems. When John Walker rejoined the US Army, he was sent on a mission in the Middle East. After the mission to take down some bad guys was complete, John Walker returned to the United States where he met Paul Keane, the president of Keane Industries. Now he explained to Walker that the reason he was contacted to be the one to pick up Cap's shield and continue the legacy was because the general public didn't want Sam Wilson to take on the role. So in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, this may be the case as well, seeing as most of the Avengers were vigilantes in Civil War, and there's probably a decent amount of folks who don't want a law-breaking Avenger calling the shots. Now in the comics, they also show John Walker footage of Sam attacking the AmeriCorps, and I'm sure somebody has world star footage of Sam flying around dropping S.H.I.E.L.D. agents off buildings at some point. So something's probably gonna come back from the past and it's gonna make the general public not trust Sam Wilson as much. That might be their way of doing it in the show rather than how they did it in the comics. And before we go on to number nine, if you guys could go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, just click that little thumb right there, not that one, unless you're from the Gladiator days, this one's much more preferred. It really does wonders for our channel, you guys are the best, thank you so much for supporting. Now back to this list. Number nine, Robot Revolution. During the Robot Revolution, Forceworks was reinstated and John Walker was put on that team. This guy moves around a lot, he loves working and he works on so many teams, you'll hear a few more on this list. He loves working. It was him, Quake, War Machine, and Mockingbird, and they were all sent to Langeras where they met an army of Deathlocks and this giant robot named Ultimo. So there were rumors that Aaron Kellyman would play Mockingbird, but in the trailers, it shows her sporting a Flag Smasher mask, so who knows? Maybe she'll flip and join a better team. Maybe she'll have these super abilities and she'll go from being a bad guy to a good guy. Who knows, perhaps she'll even side with War Machine and that leads into Armor Wars in a certain way. Hopefully, maybe. The team failed to retrieve the data on how to build the Deathlocks which MODOK created to fight Ultimo and they were all removed from the team by Maria Hill except for John Walker. He stuck around, interesting. So this dude's always around. Doesn't seem like he's the easiest guy to get rid of which is quite problematic. Number eight. The leader of STARS. STARS, or better known as Superhuman Tactical Activities Response Squad, it's an organization set up by Valerie Cooper. It was created as this police force to counter these superhuman threats that were walking about the United States of America. So John Walker was picked to be the new leader, which makes sense. He's the new Star Spangled Man. I mean, of course, Star him, star, it makes sense. The image makes sense. He was their representative. The team actually did a lot of great work together. They took down super criminals like Ronan the Accuser, Pound Cakes, Pile Driver, the Power Broker, and the Blood Brothers. But John Walker left this group and joined the new invaders. Yep, another team coming in hot. Let's do it. Number seven, the invaders. The modern invaders were a team led by US agent and ageless android, the Human Torch, former Liberty Legion member, the Thin Man, and the Blazing Skull. Quite the image when you see them all together. The team was formed by Del Rusk, who was actually Red Skull. So the Skull convinced the Thin Man to putting a team together in order for the Skull to eventually take over said team. So the new invaders came in and put a stop to Del Rusk's plan, but the sad part was they lost a team member. They lost the android Human Torch. So after this, most of the members quit. They were out of there. John Walker is great. I love how he joins teams every other week. Like everybody quits, but he keeps going. He's like the Energizer Bunny. Number six. Force works. So after the West Coast Avengers fell apart, which I mentioned in part one, if you haven't seen already, go check it out after this one, the costume and shield were tossed into the Hudson River. So Tony Stark put together a new team known as Force Works. So Scarlet Witch talked John Walker into joining the team because she believed that John was the backbone to this entire squad. She liked how he would run the show. So in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, it seems like America is in a similar mindset that Scarlet Witch was in the comics. I mean, in the trailers, they're cheering this dude on. He's the new tough leader. We love that. Anything he's doing, we're like, yeah, we're, we're gonna yell loud and follow that guy. He looks red, white, blue, and black. Yeah, man, absolutely. He planned on running the team on tight military lines and the values of strength and dedication. So John joined the team and he wore a fancy new suit with an upgraded shield. This time, it's an energy shield. So John remained a member and went against the Kree, the Scatter, the Black Brigade, and the Mandarin. One mission put John Walker against War Machine and Hawkeye, so he quit that team as well. This guy quits so much, oh my god. Number five, Omega Flight. John Walker was in favor for the Superhuman Registration Act, which is fair. 
Most people at this point in the MCU will for sure be on board as well if they weren't during Civil War. In the comics, he was assigned to Canada as an official leader of Omega Flight. So a bunch of supervillains at this time wanted to get out of Dodge. They wanted to get out of America because the Superhuman Registration Act was getting in their way, of course. So where do Americans go when sh hits the fan? Canada. They put on a big gray goose jacket and they go and complain about the cold. Well, at least a few of them end up going there, I think. Among the villains that relocated to Canada was the Purple Man and the Wrecking Crew. So the Wrecking Crew came over to Canada to continue their life of crime without the government breathing down their neck. And while they were there, they ended up freeing the great beasts. Oops. So at this time, US agent had the responsibility of keeping an eye out for the Guardian, AKA Michael Pointer, and he discovered that Michael was being used and experimented on. This guy is just the best agent. He sees everything. No matter where you're coming from, he's like, yeah, I know what you're up to. Number four, missing limbs. One of the most notable features of Bucky Barnes is of course the metal arm. Even Spider-Man comments how cool it is the first time they meet in Civil War. But US agent has also been around the missing limb block, even more so than Bucky. When he was sent into battle against Norman Osborn's Black Ops Thunderbolts team in Asgard, John Walker's left arm and leg were severed by the Thunderbolts leader, Nuke. So naturally, he retired. I mean, at that point, he's not of much use. The job literally cost him an arm and a leg. So he was given a metal hook as a hand by choice because he refused better upgrades because he didn't want to end up like a cyborg like Nuke was. So John Walker took a step down and became the warden of the supervillain prison, The Raft, which does exist in the MCU. We saw our beloved heroes stuck in there for a hot minute at the end of Civil War. So maybe this happens in the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Maybe he's a villain, maybe he loses his arm, maybe he feels sympathy and understanding for Bucky, and then now we got the Metal Limb Squad going against some greater threat that'll be introduced throughout the show. It's honestly hard to tell where the show's gonna go with this guy. He's done so much for so many teams, including number three. The Dark Avengers. This one I think will be a central plot in the show Falcon and Winter Soldier. So with the team split up, off world, or just simply not alive anymore, the world probably at least wants to feel safe, especially after disappearing for five years. There's probably so many questions, all of the questions. So the Dark Avengers could come into play, perhaps, hopefully. When the 2012 teaser for the Dark Avengers comic dropped, US agents Red, White, and Black Shield with the tagline, evil is our only hope, was on there. Mm, okay, okay, interesting, fishy. The Dark Avengers team in the comics were tossed into this alternate world where an unconscious US agent is being examined by an alternate Hank Pym. This is where that arm problem was taken care of. They just used that reality's version of the Venom symbiote and then boom, we got a replacement. A scary replacement, but we definitely got a replacement arm. Number two, Avengers standoff. During the events of Avengers standoff, we see US agent in yet again another suit but this time he's blending in looking like a normal guy. It's a normal looking suit. He attended a black market auction on Barbuda Island, which used to be AIM Island, where he placed a bid and won the Axiom Protocols, which is a pretty big deal. The Axiom Protocols is a drive that contains strategies on how to defeat every superhuman on Earth. It's a pretty sick USB right there. So this came from the encyclopedic knowledge of S.H.I.E.L.D. agent Phil Coulson. Coulson was also at the same auction disguised as Wolverine, funny enough. So he retrieves the protocols from US agent with knockout gas. So sick, it always works. Knockout gas always works. So perhaps this is something that exists in the MCU as well. I mean, even if John Walker is another Captain America, that's manageable. Like we can probably beat that, we have numbers. But if John Walker has access to everybody's weakness through some stolen shield Hydra files, it could be easy to pick his targets apart especially with the help of number one, trained by Taskmaster. Taskmaster made his comic book debut back in Avengers 195. Anthony Masters is a former S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, of course, who turned into a mercenary and assassin. His whole thing is that he can replicate your physical skills. He has photographic reflexes so he can watch back footage of you fighting and then all of a sudden he's got it locked into his brain. He knows your choreography. So he became a teacher based out of the Taskmasters Academy to train villains and agents. One of those agents of course being US agent John Walker. So Taskmaster's training focused on teaching him how to use Captain America's shield, which is something you should probably know how to use, being the new Captain America and all. So whatever happens to Taskmaster in the Black Widow movie, we could just end up seeing him train John Walker in a flashback of some sorts. It would be pretty heartbreaking also to see Sam Wilson training so hard with his shield and the homemade setup 
bouncing shields off trees with mats everywhere, doing corkscrews, only to find out that there's a super soldier who can use that shield even better than him. And especially with the public eye seeing that too, they could be like, oh, forget this guy. That guy's stronger, he looks more of the part, and he can huck that shield way further, so we're gonna trust him. Number 10, his backstory. John Walker looked up to his older brother, Michael, especially after he sacrificed his life serving in the Vietnam War. Now, John decided to follow in his brother's footsteps and he went into military service. Only thing was, he didn't feel like the hero that his brother, Michael, was. So he got the power broker treatment, which enhanced his strength in a great amount, so much so that he was able to now compete in the Universal Class Wrestling Federation. It's like the wrestlers, but like they're all super wrestlers. They're Really strong. But his agent was like, hey, instead of that, why don't you maybe, I don't know, become a superhero instead? Because, you know, those things are pretty cool right now. And that's exactly what he did. Number nine, Super Patriot. So yeah, he did just that. He carried the inspiration from his brother and donned the suit of Super Patriot. Making a spectacular first appearance in Captain America 323, John Walker was standing up for America and its true ideals. And he chose July 4th to make his debut. What a patriot, of course, of course. So Cap walks by as this is happening and he sees this big poster with his face on it, the face of Captain America with a red X through it, like he's on X Factor or something. And on the other side of the stage was the Super Patriot with a yes on his. It's a bit odd. So the camera crew leans in, some bad guys just happen to rush the stage, and then Super Patriot takes them down, all stylish too, you know? Then the cops run in, and then Super Patriot thinks, Right on cue, gents. So something's fishy here, so Cap's onto him. So he starts to publicly shame these Captain America supporters, these maniac supporters, as he calls them, the guys that rush the stage. They appear later on in the comic, but Cap takes care of them in his other suit. This happens again four issues later. Who are these guys? What's going on? So John and his three bold urban commandos staged another attack. Captain America arrives and puts a stop to it, proudly flashing his Avengers ID in the process if you got it, flaunt it. And then we have a star-spangled battle, which brings me to my next point, number eight. He puts up a good fight. So this guy's a little stronger now, sure. He wears a similar suit, he gets a few guys to stage a beat down, but when push comes to shove, can this guy go toe to toe with Captain America? Yes, the answer is yes, he most certainly can. So they battle it out for 27 minutes straight. And the Patriot never quite being able to land a blow on Cap, and Cap never quite being able to smash the Patriot hard enough to keep him down. They're both standing there out of breath, just not really sure what to do with each other at this point. But Super Patriot has some tricks up his sleeve. He hears Springsteen playing at the concert and decides to wrap it up using some throwing stars this time around. And then John, of course, calling Steve a loser as he runs away, literally adding insult to injury. Number seven, more than just a show. So he loves attention, he can take on Captain America, he loves Springsteen, but just how far will John Walker go while he's running around dressed as a superhero? Well, in Captain America 332, Warhead drops in via parachute. He arrives with a message, and the message is, make war some more, Warhead. Like he signed at the bottom, Warhead, as if they wouldn't know that's him parasailing from the sky. No, his name's Warhead. He drops down and lands in Washington where he threatens to detonate a nuclear weapon. So he sets up this table on top of the monument, which, I mean, great call. That would be rather uncomfortable otherwise. So Super Patriot shows up, breaks a police sign to show how strong and cool he is, and then he runs up the stairs super quick, ties a rope around his waist, and jumps out of the window. He climbs up the side, up to Warhead and his well-balanced table, and then he starts using throwing stars at him this time around connecting one of them to his face. And then when he was close enough, he turned the tables quite literally, he turned the table into a diving board and off he went. So John Walker is not afraid to push the envelope while he's being a flashy fraud, which makes my next point even more terrifying. Number six, he once became Captain America. So when Steve Rogers abandoned his identity due to Red Skull's manipulation of the Commission on Superhero Activities, in that same issue, somebody had to suit up. The government needed a new figure. Similar to the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, now we need a new cap, because the other one's old. Chris Evans is now old. So the next issue in the series was titled The Replacement. It's like they're casting a movie. There's headshots that are laid out. The government is now weighing their options. Okay, maybe we'll ask Jack Monroe, AKA the Nomad. After all, he has advanced abilities. He could physically do the job, but nope, he's a friend of Steve Rogers. Falcon, no chance. They even debated asking Nick Fury to take the mantle of Captain America, but they figure, He's too old. So they look at the guy who just launched a criminal off of a building. The Star Spangled Patriot gets a promotion. Meet your new Captain America. Number five, he has a posse. Steve has Sam, Simon has Garfunkel, but who's the trusty sidekick for this new Captain America? 
who backs up John Walker? Well, that would be the Bold Urban Commandos. I mentioned them a little bit earlier. They're also referred to as the Bucks. So instead of one sidekick, John Walker has three at least for a bit. They like to pop out and razzle him. One even pretends to be Captain America moments after Walker was offered the promotion. He comes out, he's like, what are you doing? Ah, I'm just kidding, it's me. Ah, what's up? So the Buckies wore Captain America masks, they wore Captain America pants, boots, but they were topless. Yeah, they were topless. I guess they were really into wrestling. They took a page out of that book and were like, you know what? No tops for us. We're just gonna be ripped and wear boots. John's right-hand man, Lamar Hoskins, had been by John's side since the military. So he was asked to be the new primary Bucky, which we see on the front cover of issue 334. Only now he goes by Battlestar, which sounds a bit cooler than Bucky. Number four, his friends betrayed him. So those sidekicks that I was telling you about, the other two besides Bucky, were now the left and right winger. They're like this new duo, this new evil duo. They look similar and they travel together. Of course, it's a whole thing. They revealed Captain John Walker's identity to the public in issue 341. In Battlestar, they almost reveal his identity, but a swift kick to the jaw from Walker interrupted that one. So left winger and right winger use John's old super patriot tech against him, like the torch, the little torch sword, they use that against him. His old friends, his old weapons, now coming back to haunt him. How lovely. They were eventually beat down and arrested, but not only was John Walker's name now out there, so was his address. So when the entire world knows your identity, you either make a deal with the devil, like Spider-Man did, or you just make a new super identity, like... Number three, tragic attack. What's a superhero without a tragic backstory involving parents? It would be nothing. It's like every superhero, uncles, aunts, parents, it's like you can't have any role models if you want to be a superhero. You gotta be an orphan or have one aunt. Now because his name was out in the public and he is Captain America, people wanted to get at him. They had some unfinished business. Specifically the watchdogs, who I'm not even going to get into because they're just absolutely horrible. So they took out John Walker's parents and he responded. Well, he did what you would expect John Walker to do at this point, so he took them out as well. Yeah, John even went so far after this where he actually wiped out left and right winger, so using that same torch yet again, John used it on them to ignite explosives that they were strapped to. Real Looney Tunes way to go out. Or Rachel Dawes. I like how he doesn't look back at the explosion either, eh? Of course not. Of course not. Number two, US agent. Eventually, John Walker's death was faked by a member of the commission and he came back with yet another upgrade. This time he came back as US agent. He had to battle an iron monger as a test, and then he took it down in a rather stylish way, and it ended up being Machine Smith after all. Shocker, it was a villain. John Walker, in the flesh, he is back and ready for action. After rescuing him from the power broker, he reunited with his old pal, Bucky slash now Battlestar. And finally, number one, West Coast Avengers. After all of this, what if I told you that once he was part of the West Coast Avengers? Yeah, this is where I think the MCU's version of John Walker will pick up. So in the comics, when Hawkeye moved to the West Coast and set up an Avengers team there, the government wanted to put a government official to kind of make sure things are running smoothly, to keep an eye on everything. At this time, the vision was a bit of a problem as well, so it kind of made sense. So they sent in US agent John Walker. So the cover of the same West Coast Avengers comic has White Vision right on the front. So perhaps with WandaVision now ending with White Vision being a thing that's out there and the Falcon and the Winter Soldier starting, we could be getting close to seeing this West Coast Avengers team in the MCU. What do you guys think? Kicking off the list at number 10, we have the Power Broker. John Walker looked up to his older brother Michael quite a bit, especially after he sacrificed his life serving during the Vietnam War. So John decided to follow in his brother's footsteps and he went into the military service as well. But that still wasn't enough. John felt like he still wasn't the hero that he needed to be. He kept comparing himself to Michael and what exactly is a hero without a few super abilities on the side, am I right? So he paid a visit to the Power Broker. The Power Broker is being teased throughout Falcon and Winter Soldier right now, but what do they do? Who are they? Well, they trade their knowledge of technology for high paying customers who want to undergo this risky process to basically become a superhero. It's like a gamble to get some powers. Half the time, the clients wouldn't even survive. See, it's not that easy to become a superhero, but it worked for John Walker. Unfortunately, it enhanced his strength a hefty amount. So now we have the motivation, we have the superpowers, so what's the next step? And before we continue on with this list, guys, if you want to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, that would be great. You guys are super helpful. Thank you so much for your support. Now let's fly right back into this list. Number nine, he became Super Patriot. Before becoming Captain America, John Walker tried the hero gig just in another fashion. First, he was the Super Patriot. 
He made his spectacular first appearance in Captain America 323, and John Walker was standing up for America and its true ideals. Nice. He even chose July 4th to make his grand entrance. What a patriot. What a super patriot. So Cap walks by as this is happening when he's making his big debut, and he sees a big poster with his face on it, with a big red X through the center. It's kind of like America's Got Talent. And then on the other side, we see the super patriot with a big yes on his side. Okay, that's odd. So now he's starting to publicly shame Captain America in front of his supporters. He's trying to win over the crowd. And if a cool America monologue wasn't enough to do it, he had his own buck, the bold urban commandos. There were three of them, and they staged attacks to make John Walker look better. But you could only look so good until number eight fought Captain America. So where John and his three bold urban commandos staged another attack, Captain America arrived to save the day. And then readers get treated to a star-spangled battle. And John puts up a pretty good fight as well. He can actually go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Captain America. Thanks, Power Broker. It worked. They end up battling it out for 27 minutes straight. 27 minutes. That's like a full TV episode of just getting punched in the face. That's terrible. But Super Patriot was never able to really land a blow on Cap, and Cap was never able to keep Super Patriot down. So they're just standing there out of breath for 27 minutes like, now what? So Super Patriot leaves before doing the worst thing ever in all of this. He calls Steve a loser, and then he runs away. Number seven. No rules. Captain America 332, the villain Warhead drops in via parachute with a message. Make war some more. Signed, Warhead. You know, in case we confuse them with somebody else falling from the skies. He set up a table on top of the Washington Monument, and then he pulled out a nuclear device. So it's not looking like a good situation at all. Perfect time for a hero like Super Patriot. Yeah, he came in and used his powers and saved the day, proving that he can indeed be worthy of the hero life. Well, he tried to, but it didn't go as well as he planned. He climbed up the side, up to Warhead and his well-balanced table, and then he started hucking throwing stars at him at first. He hit him in the face a couple times. And then when that didn't work and he was close enough, he just grabbed the table and threw it into a diving board of doom and just hucked this guy right off into the skies. And he did not survive the fall at all. I mean, you could have handled this in literally any other way. You have superpowers. Come on, use your head. Number six, became Captain America. One of the biggest game changers in the MCU was when John Walker came out at the end of the episode, winked at the camera, and then showed us his brand new Captain America suit in the meantime. This happened, of course, in the comics as well, when Steve Rogers had to abandon his identity due to the Red Skull's manipulation of the Commission on Superhuman Activities. So now somebody has to suit up, somebody has to take his spot. The government needed a new figure. So in issue 333 of Captain America, it was titled The Replacement. The government's weighing their options on who should be the next to lead the nation, so they go with the guy who just launched a dude off of a building. Awesome, John Walker just got the promotion of a lifetime. And now we're all screwed. Number five. Buck upgrade. So now he's got a brand new suit, he's got the best frisbee of all time, but what else does John Walker need? Well, how about some backup for starters? He brings back the bold urban commandos who I mentioned earlier. The Buckies, as they're referred to, wore Captain America masks, boots, pants, but they were topless for some reason. I don't know, maybe they were into wrestling growing up. John's right-hand man, Lamar Hoskins, has been by John's side since the military, so he was obviously asked to be the main sidekick, who we also got to meet in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And he stood tall on the front cover of Captain America issue 334, and now he goes by the name Battlestar. The other two guys also got a cool upgrade, now they're referred to as left and right winger. They were cool until they revealed John's identity to the public, and then they were kind of not cool. Left winger and right winger tried to use John's old super patriot tech against against him, but they were eventually beaten down and arrested. So now with his identity out and about, it was only time for John to take on another super alias. This time, number four, coming US agent. He's back, again, again. One of his more stylish looks, if you ask me, but John Walker returns, this time with a blacked out Captain America suit, and the shield is also less spangly. He comes back and he's put to the test. He's forced to battle an ironmonger, and when he goes to take it down alone, the shield actually seems to work out pretty well for him. Because in the comics, it was actually Taskmaster who trained him how to use that shield in the first place. And judging by the trailers for Black Widow, because we still have to watch those until it's released, it looks like Taskmaster can throw a frisbee quite well. Number three, he joined the Avengers. In West Coast Avengers issue 45, when Hawkeye sets up a team, well, on the West Coast, the government wanted an official in there to make sure all was going well. So funny enough, at this time in the comics, Vision was also trying to get government clearance again. So they sent in US agent. This led to John rescuing his former partner, Battlestar, from the power broker. 
So now this guy has his buddy back and he's part of the Avengers. That's a pretty risky spot to put John Walker. I hope we never see him join the Avengers on the big screen, but seeing White Vision in the mix now kind of makes me nervous. Maybe the West Coast Avengers will happen. Maybe, just maybe. Number two, he joined the Force Works. After the West Coast Avengers fell apart, because naturally that's what happens when John Walker is part of the team, the costume and the shield were tossed to the side. So Tony Stark put together an all new team known as Force Works. Scarlet Witch talked John Walker into joining the team because she honestly believed that John was the backbone to the entire squad. She kind of liked how he would run things. So he planned on running the team on tight military lines and the values of strength and dedication. So John joined the team and he wore a fancy new suit with an upgraded shield. This time it was an energy shield. John remained a member and went against the Kree, the Scatter, and the Mandarin. He was doing an all right job until he reverted back to his old ways. One mission had Forceworks team up with the Avengers and that wasn't a pleasant reunion. John Walker went into conflict with War Machine and Hawkeye, so he had to quit the Force Works as well. God, you can't put this guy anywhere. And last but not least, number one, he took the serum. In the emotional ending of episode four, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, we find out what John Walker did to the remaining vial of the Super Soldier serum. He took it. Yeah. Zemo broke most of them, except for one. John talked it over with Lamar Hoskins about if he would take the serum if presented the opportunity. So when Walker is, he does in fact take it. And it's shown to us in a pretty brutal way. While looking for Lamar, Walker reunited with Sam and then they were all ambushed by the Flag Smashers, Nico and Dovik included. Now, Nico held back Walker for a moment, just long enough that Carly Morgenthau would attack Walker. Now, luckily Lamar got in the way and then that's when Carly accidentally delivered a fatal blow to Lamar. And this caused John Walker to lash out, and it's pretty bad. He can't control himself at this point. The serum has made him powerful and even more insane. And when he's attacking Nico in the heat of the moment, he goes a little bit too far. Poor Nico. This was the same episode where he told Carly that he was actually a Captain America fan growing up. So, double oof.